with me, Cheryl Essington, today that had a relationship and the marriage that was looked like created in heaven. But then some turmoil happened. And so often in life, we're excited about what's happening. But then when things change so drastically in such a way that we never expected, how do you move on? And what do you do with that? And how do you start living instead of feeling like you're dying in these relationships? So Cheryl, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah. So you were excited. You got married. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So uh, we met... Um, probably about seven years before we got married, and uh -huh. we dated for six and a half of those years. Mm -hmm. um, good friends at first, and then it slowly rolled into being more of a, a serious relationship. Um, yeah, and we just enjoyed doing everything together. We had a lot in common, um, you know, all the way down to liking the same movies, the same taste and decor. Just the, Really? Just, My husband just... and I are opposite in everything, <laughs> you know, so that's fun. Well, you know the old expression, opposites attract, but we really enjoyed. Um, and then there was a couple of years um, at the very beginning where I was actually in another state, but we kept in touch with each other. And that was, again, just friendship at that point. But we knew that there's just a strong connection there, right? We just really um, uh, valued each other's advice and things and so forth, bounced ideas so off of each married. other. So you got married. So we get married. And, um, yeah, after six and a half years of, of dating, we had two children, uh, two daughters. Um, we we're both in the same field business, uh, which is uh, hair. We both do hair and started our own little place. Um, we met in Minneapolis, and we moved uh, oh, a couple hours away from there, uh, more rural, if you will, a smaller community that was more of a tourist town. And uh, there was an existing business that the gentleman wanted to sell it. And we thought, I think we can fix this up, and this might be a good place the for us. The dream together. The dream to do things together. together. Yeah. And this was both to do hair, to move together. Yes. Yet your relationship was strong. I remember you telling me that that your husband at the time said that he, you were his soulmate. It was like perfect. Yeah. So he um, actually, and, and even further down on the story, once the divorce happened, um, two years after the divorce, uh, he had told me that you are my soulmate. Um, but we, we, So what just went wrong? Be. Where did it start? What actually went wrong? So that actually is a good question because it took me a long time to try to figure that out. It was a slow process. Um, after our second child was probably about a year old was when I noticed um, there, was, there was other elements going on as well, which put some pressure on. Um, and maybe that's what raised this to the surface. But at any rate, I noticed him pulling away where he didn't want to confide, didn't want to talk about a lot of things. Um, even when we were sleeping at night, tucked the covers between us, makes like the, there was a separation, eventually sleeping on the couch and don't touch me, don't talk to me. And I'm like, what? It, it wasn't an argument. So I'm like, I don't understand what's going on. Come on, I'm your best friend. We had six and a half years before we got married. Tell me, what, what is this? And six and a half years were great. Never an issue. They weren't an issue. Of course, we weren't married, and it was, you know, how dating can be because you have your time away from the person, your time together, yeah. your time. So in this intertwining, we, there was still the camaraderie uh, in the marriage of we still had the same tastes and things. There was never an argument about how the household was to be run, that, you know, all that stuff. So what was, was not pulling him away from you? What would cost this? Maybe the children? Because there was some, sometimes you hear that children become. Mm -hmm. Part of that that right, right. It, that could make an impact. I, th I hear what you're saying. I, I think what happened is so this the small community that we moved to and bought that business and got things running. Um, once the baby was born, uh, she was probably about six months old, and we decided we were too far away from my family, too far away from his family. So whose family would we like to move closer to so that they can know their cousins, aunts and uncles, grandma, grandpa? And we chose to move near his, which was in Upper uh, Michigan, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Now, there wasn't a lot of work there, but his father was a contractor and said, I've got so many jobs right now that I need guys. Come up here and you got a job. But it sounds like the problem could be different as just work. Right. Related, so we move up you know? there, and what happened is all the jobs that he was promised fell through. Either the permits, mm -hmm. the job was smaller, so dad said, I can do the job myself, I don't need you, son. He didn't have any work. So I worked two separate jobs. So I think 
masculinity. It felt emasculated. Because Failure. He, he couldn't be the provider of the family. We went through our savings that entire year, ended up on welfare and food stamps by the end of the year. And during that year when all that was happening was when all this was probably always there, but it, it surfaced. It caused it to surface where he just, yeah, felt, felt small, insignificant. Um, you know, why can't I be a man? Why can't I provide for my family? And, and it was not, there wasn't a lack of him trying. He was trying. There was just no work. There was no, but, but so he is distancing himself from you. Was he distancing himself from the children as well? No. Not, it was just you. Just me. What was going on? So there was nothing behind the scenes. There wasn't, uh, you know, I was seeing someone else. He was, there was absolutely none of, that. none of that going on. And his family too were like, well, you know, hey. Were you believers at the time? So here's the thing. Um, I had accepted the Lord when I was 14. Mm -hmm. And I had a strong walk with the Lord till I graduated high school. Mm -hmm. And about the time I met him was when I was just kind of getting wild and doing my own thing and just exploring, oh, there's a lot in life to do and a lot to see. And that's when we met. So he claims that he is, he's a super nice person, raised as a devout Catholic, all of his family, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandma, grandpa. I had found the Lord and had stepped into an Assemblies of God type setting and pursued a deeper relationship with the Lord. So his was more on whatever Catholicism would teach him. And it was more the, you better do right because then you could be punished or you'll go to hell for that. Or, you, you know, it was more that side of the coin, never the loving, nurturing God. It was always the um, performance driven. So he was not acting on that. He'd go to Mass once in a while. If I chose that uh, once we were married that I wanted to go to a church that was something that I was, ra uh, I was more comfortable with and had raised myself in because I was the first one in my family to get saved. Um, so I was not raised in that setting as well. I had to choose that path once I was 14. So fast forward that into the marriage, and he's like, sure, I'll, I'll try whatever. And he thought it was wonderful because um, it was a— he said, wow, people are friendly. I understand what the pastor's saying. This all made sense. But he didn't and apply it to his life. So there was most likely a yeah. wound stuck in him Absolutely. somewhere there. Absolutely. So did he know what the wound was at the time? So he knew, I, I think he knew deep down, uh, there was some uh, experiences he went through. Like what? Before we met. So as a child, um, he was an altar boy, uh -huh. and he was molested by the priest. Ah, okay. Yeah. There's a deeper... Yes. wound inside of there. And he's such a, a caring, giving, gentle person that I think he heaped it upon himself. There must be shame, must be something wrong with me that the priest would do this to I me. I want to hear more about that. When, when those wounds are not addressed, it could cause huge issues in the marriage. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss this. Are you ready to inspire and change lives? You can make a difference for a better tomorrow. God created you for more. You matter. There is an unprecedented pandemic of forgotten hearts. You can bring hope and answers. Inmates feel alone, afraid, and abandoned. Now is the time to find, to stand, to change, and transform lives. God loves them unconditionally. Adopt a champion empowers inmates to be a champion within themselves, within their family, and in the world. There are three ways you can help. Become part of our team, pray, and donate. Together, we can make a difference. You can start today. Go to adoptachampion.org. Cheryl Essington did everything she possibly could to save the relationship. She saw her husband just taking more and more distance from the point he even would sleep on the couch. No arguments, no fights. They were soulmates for each other. They loved each other. They were excited about it. But the distance kept growing bigger till the ultimate happened. What was the cause? And how do you pick it up from there? That's what, that's what has happened to you. So there's the distance. There is the no way back. There is the going apart. They're coming back together. All of that. And it did not work. And then you find out he has been molested by a priest at a young age. 
And, and that caused a huge wound at the time. But why would he distance from you? Couldn't he just get counseling or help or professional, right. Right. you know? So when we realized that um, um, this was, uh, the, a separation was needed, um, I moved back towards where my family lived in a whole different state, which was um, Minnesota, and then took the girls with. And he knew that this was not, okay, that's it, we're done. It was more, how can we work on this? And there was more work where my parents and my family were, where I grew up, versus where we were living near his family. So I thought, I'm going back that direction, and I'll have my, my parents for support and to help watch the kids and you know all that so kind of thing. I'm sure so there were visitations comes. that you're coming together. So then we were going back and forth. We would take uh, a couple of weekends out of the month where I would go back to Michigan, and it would be just him and I, and we'd really try and talk and work on this. And then two weekends a month, he would come towards us so he could see the kids. He missed the girls. you know. And So the whole time, the object was, let's work on this. Let's see what we can do. And I do remember that at a point when it was just him and I, and we'd just like rent a cabin in uh, Northern um, Peninsula, when it was just him and I, and he was really getting vulnerable and he was really opening up. And, and literally, um, it was a deep, tear-jerking moment. And through his sobbing, he just said, I don't think I can go to counseling, he said, because if I go there, if I go down that path to get to the bottom of this, he said, I'll lose my mind and I'll never come back. He said, wow. so I can't go there. So he was really hurt. Now, he also was a trucker and had gang raped, right? Yes. That had happened yeah. against him. Yes. So there was several years. The altar boy, I think, was early teens uh, incident. And then he was already 18, graduated out of the home, uh, got his trucker's license and was driving for a, a big national, you know, cross country. And so the truckers have truck stops where you stop and you can sleep in your cab, you can gas up, you can shower there, you can have a nice meal at the diner and a uh, one stop stop for them. And it was when he was there uh, taking a shower that he was gang raped by some of the other truckers. So already I'm, I'm thinking uh, as a believer, there was a spirit that probably got attached to him, whether he invited it or not. And he didn't want to help. He didn't want to go to the pain. Yeah, it was it was so over the top for him that those were his words. Yeah. If if I go, I'm afraid to go there because if I go there, I'll lose my mind and I'll never come Which back. Which is a total lie of the devil. You yes. know, let, let's be real. I'm afraid to go there and, and, and I will lose my mind. Those are all yeah. lies. But in the meantime, it's your marriage. You have right. two children. Right. The marriage is falling apart. Right. Now so what? he wanted he, he wanted the marriage to work, but he didn't know how to make it work. And I didn't know how to help him other than... I, I can just be there for you. I'm, I'm not a counselor. I don't know how to counsel you through this. I've never experienced that. So that's not anything. I, I don't even know where to start on that other than to just say, oh, I'm, I'm trying to feel your pain. I'm trying to understand, which I, I can't because I've never experienced that. Were you praying for him? Oh, my Were you gosh. Doing all yes. the, you yes. know, what we, as oh, yeah. we think we can do. Absolutely. Expecting answers. So a year of that back and forth of us trying to work on it or him coming to see the kids, he decides at the end of that year, let's try and make this work. Let's, let's, Great. Let's, let's, let's not end this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Which was the whole goal. Had he dealt with the wound at the ta time? The pain? No. So he still hadn't dealt with the pain. But he also didn't want to lose, lose what the family, he has kids and his and myself. So he decided there's more work where I'm living. The kids and I are already settled. I'll pack up things. I'll move back with you and the kids back to Minnesota. And there was work for him. So he was able to get work. And I was already working at that point. So and you're back together. Back Everything together. is going great. We're trying. How long before it got tough again? So we were together for one year of him moving back with mm -hmm. me and the kids. And we also tried to see um, a pastor, you know, just to see if we can do some counseling. And we probably met three times with the pastor. Um, we each tried to set up separate where he could be with the pastor one-on-one, -on -one, I could be with the pastor one-on-one, -on -one, but three times where we came together as a couple. And he was just, he was so broken. He, 
he, he couldn't even answer the questions when the pastor would ask. You know, he'd ask a question to me, what do you think about that? What's your response? How do you feel about that? And he just kind of hung his head and he was just sulking because he was so broken, he couldn't even. So what, what happened from there on? So then after that third session, um, he just said, I, I, I can't go anymore. He said, I just, I can't do this. And then we knew at that point, then what do we do? If we can't get help, we can't stay like this. So then what? So then one day he just approached me, and I, and I wasn't shocked at the point where he said, look, he said, I'm just going to get the paperwork for divorce. He said, we just need to go our separate ways. And, you know, if you would just not fight me on this. And I'm like, I, I've, I have fought as hard as I can fight. I, I don't know what else to do at this point. I said, bring the paperwork. Let's sign and let's be done. Now, now I just want you to know. Um, this is a situation, I have been divorced myself, and, and it's not God's choice. This is people's choice. This is not God's choice. But God still loves you. God will still work with you. But inviting Jesus into the marriage is the be very best thing you can do. And if you're stuck in that situation right now, I would love to pray for you with our team. I encourage you to call us at 855-515-5550 or go to barbtv.org. And I can tell you, I was divorced for two years, but me and my husband remarried. And we are still together today. We will stay together today. So there is hope. I just want you to know that right now. But that's not what happened with you. Correct. But Jesus stayed part of your life, but yes. you had to move on. Yes. Single is tough. Oh, Financial. Oh, that was The huge. loneliness at night was the kicker usually for me. So your husband went his own way, but that's not where it ended. What happened next? So he uh, remained in the same community, the same town, which was my town where I grew up because his work was established. And he wanted to be near the girls. He wanted to yeah. not just... Uh, he and I were divorcing. He didn't want to divorce from them and their life. Mm -hmm. So uh, he lived about oh, a mile and a half, two miles away from me. And uh, we had the arrangement, whatever the courts decided, which was not much visitation for him. They usually favor heavily for the female. So I had full custody and he would get every other weekend. Mm -hmm. So we let that be what the courts decided. And then he and I just worked it out between us. I'm, as much as the kids want to see you or you want to see them, we'll figure this out. So we set up some arrangements for that. And I want to hear more about that. Cheryl got the biggest surprise of her life. Stay tuned. People tell me, Barb, I can't hear the voice of God. How can I hear His voice? I used to have a hard time with this too. I spent years learning the difference between my own head and God's voice. When I learned how, my life changed. Transformations that used to take me weeks now only take me seconds. I want to share with you everything I learned in those few years in only three hours at no charge. Go to our website, barbtv.org, and sign up for our free course titled Empower a Champion Hearing the Voice of God. Many of you are struggling in life. There is hope. Our passion is for you to have breakthrough by clearly hearing the voice of God. Go to barbtv.org under the tab Empower a Champion and sign up today. So you're apart, you're divorced now, he has child's uh, visitation, you know, it, it's a good relationship, not bad. You got the biggest surprise of your life. What did you find out? So he had actually uh, shared with me, he said, um, I'm, I'm, I'm gay. We, mm. we just we can't work on this. So, and the reason that that came out was because two years after the divorce, um, he, he would still ask my opinion on things. And he said, could you come over? He said, I, I made a prototype of something and I just like your opinion on it. And when I came over, he seemed more friendly, like he was sending me mixed signals is what I was feeling. So I just point blank asked him, I said, what, what are we doing here right now? Where are we going with this? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, because this has all been done for a couple of years and you're sending me mixed signals as if you're interested again. And he said, I can't do this. I'm gay. You are my soulmate. I do love you, but we can't do this. How did that hit you, that moment? Um, yeah, I was, it, it gave 
some closure to, okay, that explains a lot of things. Um, but it also hurt because he, he was giving me mixed signals. And so I knew in his heart, he was still hoping that this could go forward by the signals he was giving me. But then he just closed himself off again and said, no. How do you overcome that? It feels like you lived with a lie for years. Yes. And, and now you have to move on. Jesus help or, or was, did you felt like, yeah. like there was a defeat going on inside of your heart? How do you move forward from something like that? Right. So that exact moment, then I said to him, you know, I, I don't mind that you want opinions on things, but I'm not going to come every time that you call. I said, we, we literally need to, if we're going to be divorced, we talk about the kids and try and run our households as smoothly as we can. Um, but other than that, I, I just can't be your best friend and be here for you all the time. And so then, um, and he said, okay, I'll, I'll, I will try that. So you agree. move on in life. Yes. And now you have your identity. Everything seems crushed that moment. Oh, yeah. So. Oh, yeah. How did you find your identity at that point? And what is your identity? Okay. So two things happened at that point. One, the uh, oldest daughter um, started running away. And I could tell that this marriage, separation, divorce was, was just killing her. And um, so he made a suggestion. He said, why don't you just let her come with me for a while? Like for 30 days. He said, just try not to contact her and let me see if I can get to the root of, of what's going on. Because he still loved his girls. They still loved spending time with him. And I had asked him at that point, could you please, if you are involved with anybody, not have this person ever present when the girls are with you? I'm, I'm just asking you that because he and I agreed, we're also not telling the kids until they're 21. So that I'm sure the girls us. found out at a point, there was probably something around the house that's something. Yes. But how yeah. is it that, that you moved on with your life? How did you find your identity? Yes. God longs to help you and Absolutely. take care of you. What did that look like for you? So the fact of her moving out and then his and I just realizing this is never, ever going to go anywhere. It's really done, done, done. And then felt like I was losing my daughter as well, mm. not knowing how to help her. Very painful. Very painful. So I turned to the youth pastor at our church who was close to my age and a female. And um, I had been very involved with the youth group at church, uh, helping with different functions and so forth. So we had formed a bond, a, a friendship, if you will. And so I just called her one day and I just said, I, I'm just going to lose it. Mm -hmm. I absolutely need to talk to somebody right, right now. And she said, I'll come over. And she did. Mm -hmm. and it's, I can still feel it's that. It's so fresh, isn't it? Uh, yeah. And so she prayed with me, and not, not only just stayed with me and prayed with me that day, but would check on me periodically and say, how are we emotionally? How are we working through this? And I didn't really understand my full identity, and she was helping me with that as well. And so between my times alone with God and her coming over and being a, a confidant, if you will, and then there was another woman who became a mentor to me that the Lord highlighted me to her. Um, I, I didn't really, uh, I knew of her, but there was no relationship there. She, I became an assignment for her, if you want to look at it that way, where God highlighted and said, you need to speak things into this woman. You need to be part of her life. Mm -hmm. And it was so huge that as an adult, single, trying to be mom and dad, four part-time jobs, losing the daughter, trying to just navigate all of this. I just cried out to God and said, I can't do this alone. Correct. Yeah, correct. So it truly, it truly was him just meeting me in that place wow. and then showing my identity to me of saying, what you've heard and what you've experienced, this is what you're not. Mm. This is what came at you, but this is what you're not. Here's what you are. Wow, that's Here's so who you are. And slowly, just inch by inch by inch, just touching all those areas in my heart, in my life, to say, this is who you really are. These things happen to you, but that is not defining who you are. Exactly. And, exactly. and I think 
the struggle in my ex's mind. It defined and made him think, this is who I am. So good. So, so then good. there was the bigger why in the road between us mm -hmm. of obviously this is never, an, an, unless I um, understand my full identity, unless he is allowed to, um, or longing to get the counseling and the help that he needs so that he can let go of the lies that he thinks is who his identity is when it really isn't. Um, it, we're just going to keep going like this. And, and so the closer we you went to the Lord, yeah. the wound that was so raw, so real. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. Are you healed today? Well, as you can see, it, there is tender spots there. Of as course I there is. As I remember going yeah. through all of that. Um, I, I would say probably 75%. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because God always, honestly, in, until we leave this earth, it's a journey, a journey, a, a walk in our life with God. And I always believe that there's more areas that he can put his finger on in my life. And as he shows me those, I try to release that because we have a choice. We feel his finger poking at that. and We can say, yeah, I can't go there. Or yes, it's time. And it's up to us because he's a And the more gentleman. you surrender, the more the you more. trust him, the more healing will take oh place. Oh, my gosh. Not only does he remove, just like Scripture says, when, when something that's not supposed to be there is removed, say it's a, a demon on your back, something uh, demonic, um, when it's removed, it leaves a hole. Yeah. And if that hole's not filled seven times, comes back, the demon, and he brings others with. So that's when I cry out to the Holy Spirit and I say, I don't want any more of that. Please fill me with what you always originally intended when I was formed in my mother's womb so that I can understand that and I can, I can not only feel the abundant life, just feel it for me, but I can actually bring joy to you because I'm living the life you're asking me and always desired for me to live. Cheryl, thank you so much for being so vulnerable today. You're welcome. And, and sharing You're welcome. in your know, life. Please call us so we can help you and pray with you and connect with you about relationships or whatever you're struggling with right now. Barb TV or go to 855-515-5550. And I want you to know that God will not leave you where you're at. It was never his choice for you to carry those wounds that have been so heavy on your heart. Instead, he wants to help you, uplift you, and change them and transform you. So I just really want to encourage you. Allow him to transfer you in the new you. God loves you, and so do I. Basically, I felt like my life couldn't be any better than it was. Things got difficult when my wife at that time wanted to get a divorce. I just indulge my flesh, wine, women, and song to try and make myself happier and feel better. I wanted to find somewhere where I could get in touch with the Holy Spirit. God took him from the depths of despair to using him as a servant of the Most Highest God.